Okay, good morning, people. Um, happy snow day. I did not think that there was going to be a snow day, so I do not have my notes at home. So we're going to have to do notes this way. So um, we are at the top of page five, and we are beginning this look at um, politics in the Gilded Age. And we're going to discuss that term Gilded Age, because you do need to know what that term means. And I thought I had like clicky things here where I could turn on my, but I guess not. All right. Sorry about that. <clears throat> so the Gilded Age is a term that's coined by Mark Twain. And what gilded actually means is that it's something that is shiny and looks golden on the outside, but on the inside, it doesn't stand up. It's not the same quality. And for Mark Twain, it meant rotten to the core. And that's what our Gilded Age looks like, that we're on the outside, shiny, bright, golden, but on the inside, some really messed up stuff. And those of you that had me for world history, if you remember when we went through all those time periods of all those civilizations and talked about their golden age, when everything was awesome and great, the United States doesn't quite get a golden age. We get the Gilded Age. It's also a time period of unforgettable presidents. And again, these groups of presidents, almost everyone uh, uh, forgets their names. Hayes, Garfield, Arthur, and Harrison. And the only reason um, uh, people remember Harrison again is uh, because he is the grandson of another president. But anyway, Congress and business becomes more influential than the presidency. This is a very important statement. I would highlight that. And if my tools were working, I would have highlighted it so that you could see that. But what runs the country during this Gilded Age is Congress and Congress being corrupted by big business. And that's what this time period is going to do. And again, it's why we have this explosion of, um, uh, economic power. Grover Cleveland's our only exception and very um, awesome to APUSH students. You are never asked anything at all about these presidents because really there's not much um, to um, talk about except Garfield, who's going to be assassinated. Era was the most highly competitive politically in the United States, meaning that there wasn't one strong political party. Everything's going to be split down the middle. Um, president elections were close. The House of Representatives switched six times between 1869 and 1891 and voter turnout highest levels in U.S. history. I don't think we've even come close to having the same voter turnout. Now, <clears throat> as I said yesterday, part of it is because there was high levels of voter and election fraud. So those numbers might not actually be accurate because there probably were people that voted quite often more than once. Politicians were extremely cautious not to tip the balance we're back to that same idea of balance and power and money issue and the tariff issue are the two areas that really separated the, the parties. There wasn't really a lot of difference between a Republican and a Democrat in this time period, except how they felt about money. Should we be on a gold standard? Should we be on a silver standard? Should we have greenbacks? And then the tariff very simply was, should we have them? Should we not have them? So social issues are going to be more pronounced. Republicans chased their lineage back to Puritanism and stressed strict codes of personal morality. So this is where we begin this um, uh, belief that what is the role of the government? Is the role of the government to govern morality? And again, it's a wiggle line for what we allow government intrusion into our personal lives and what we don't allow. And at this point, before the Gilded Age, there really was no personal intrusion into the lives of the citizens of the United States. The government did not govern morality. There was none of that. Our reform era started asking them to, right? Like with the temperance movement and uh, political reform, I'm sorry, prison reform and uh, reform for the mentally um, handicapped. So we had started asking, but we didn't get really far. The Gilded Age is going to open that door even more. And the progressive age, which comes next, is really going to begin legislating morality. So we've got uh, this idea as a middle class WASP values. And again, you need to know what WASP stands for because it is important. It's white, Anglo-Saxon, 
Protestant. And that P is really important as we move into this time period when we start having a lot of Catholic immigrants, that Protestant will be really important. Some will refer to these as Victorian. They will have a very heavy support from businessmen. Um, support for the Midwest, small rural towns, heavy support from African Americans, which might be a surprise um, in this beginnings. Emphata, emphasize the identity of self interest. People should accept their place in society because the wealthy know what's best. Please, please, please circle that. That's why it gets heavy support from businessmen. That's why it's kind of a surprise that African Americans are supporting this idea because the whole point of it is that wealthy people know what's the best for the country. And that goes all the way back to, remember our Federalist, government should be governed by the best people. So we're kind of really uh, keeping that same line open. The GAR, the Grand Army of the Republic, is an influential fraternal organization of several hundred thousand Union vets from the Civil War, and they are going to be highly influential. They are going to hold a lot of political power. Democrats consisted mainly of German Lutherans and Catholics, and that again will be our Irish immigrants that are coming. Uh, religions uh, stress less stern views of human weakness. Their views are opposed to government efforts to impose a single moral standard. These are going to be the people that say, wait, you can't say just one thing fits everybody, right? That will be uh, what these Democrats will say. Support came from the solid South and large industrial cities. And 2D is very important, emphasized economic equity, that everyone should have opportunity. Prohibition and education become intense issues at the local level. Okay, why can't I get to the next page? Oh, I think I got to go this way. Okay, sorry. So this should be page six, yes. <clears throat> Patronage and bribery. Patronage means more or less you own someone in the sense of you pay them to vote how you want them to vote. And that would be representatives and senators. Bribery, I think everybody understands that, what that is. So the definition is giving away offices for votes, kickbacks, party service. That's patronage. I'm going to give you something and I expect something in return. Government employment expanded significantly, especially in places like the post office. Um, and it really becomes a very corrupt system that's going to take a long time to fix once we begin uh, that process. Reformers targeted the spoil system as being inefficient and corrupt. And again, the civil service reform is largely anti Irish in politics. They don't want Irish people. And again, when you see they don't want Irish, it's really they don't want Catholics. And that, again, is important. So now we've got a couple of definitions, and you need to know these words. They're weird. They instantaneously, if you remember them, tell you this is the Gilded Age, because these terms are used nowhere else except in the Gilded Age, and you need to know what they are and a name that goes with them, okay? So the Stalwarts are led by Roscoe Conkling, is a Senate a senator who favored the spoil system. So the spoil system is what we always had. So to me, when I think about a stalwart, I think of somebody standing strong, like this is how it is, this is how it's always been, and we're not going to change. That's the spoil system that goes all the way back to Andrew Jackson. The half breeds are going to be led by James J or G James G Blaine. He's a congressman who favored civil service reform. So again, that civil service reform means we're going to reform the government. I think of these half breeds as I kind of like the way it is now, but I think it would be better if we did this. So they're like halfway, like let's not get rid of everything because I really benefit from having these things, but I'm ready to go halfway with this civil service. And then we have my favorite, the mugwumps. The mugwumps are represented in thought by Thomas Nast, our political cartoonist. 
And these groups of people, you need to know these because they are actually really the most important. These are young liberal reformers. So these are the new young people that say things need to change. They favored reconstruction policies to help African Americans, and they are definitely anti-corruption. And that, again, is what makes them significant. They These three groups of people are going to fight all within those Republican factions. These are all Republicans, but the party is split into these three groups. All right. So election of 1876, supporters urged Grant to run for a third term. Grant was willing, um, but no, nope, we really think we like that two term. And so um, they moved to nominating Rutherford B. Hayes. Now this election is the election of 1877 and 18, 1876, 1877. It is the most corrupt election in the history of our country. Most often in historical circles, we refer to Rutherford B. Hayes as a Rutherford, Rutherford B. Hayes, because he really should never have been president. So here's what happens. Republicans nominate Rutherford B. Hayes. <clears throat> Democrats, Sam Tilden. Remember the guy that brings down Boss Tweed. Tilden was only one of three candidates to gain or win a majority of votes. Grover Cleveland. Anyway, so we get election fraud. South Carolina, Florida, Louisiana said, and we're not really sure that our election was uh, all above board. We think there might have been some um, fraud in our election. So what happens is known as the Compromise of 1877. You need a big box around this. You need to understand it. You need to be able to explain it to yourself because it is a monumental event in the history of our country. It radically changes the direction of our country. And uh, it is uh, something, again, that is full of corrupt politicians. So... Here's what the compromise says. Hayes would become president in return for withdrawing the remaining troops from the last two states, Louisiana and South Carolina. So the South says, we will vote for your Republican if you end Reconstruction. And that's what you need to make sure you write out to the side. The Compromise of 1877 is about ending Reconstruction in the South. Republicans assured Democrats of presidential patronage and support for a bill subsidizing a Southern transcontinental railroad. And again, the Compromise of 1877, big giant box around number three, officially ended Reconstruction. Black rights sacrificed in the South. The North gave up any forward movement they had made in assuring rights for African Americans in the South with the Compromise of 1877 so that they could get Hayes elected as president. And that, my friends, is corruption, corruption, corruption. It is, and again, changes the direction of our country. Uh, freed African Blacks are no longer a priority anywhere. And instead of the Civil War bringing um, um, any kind of change of lifestyle to freed enslaved people, pretty much set them back. Um, and almost like other than that, they were owned back to pre-Civil War. Um, so well, where did that go? Okay, we're going to stop there. All right, we're going to stop there and end that for the day. Um, please don't forget to come to school tomorrow for testing. I'm also going to have your calendars and the other little bits of um, homework that I haven't already passed out. I don't think I gave you your cheat sheet and a few other things in your TikTok assignment. So um, try to stop by in my room and pick that up tomorrow if you'd like. Enjoy the rest of your snow day. And again, don't forget to come tomorrow for iStep. Bye, guys.